So without beating about the bush, um, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Joanna Brook to the podium. Um, Joanna is full professor in UCD School of Archaeology. She has researched and written extensively on the Bronze Age in Britain and in Ireland. Um, so we look forward to seeing what Joe has to say about Bronze Age relations, genetics, kinship and gender in later prehistory. Thanks, Joe. I've got to the age now where I need several pairs of glasses. So before I start, I want to take a moment to mark how much I appreciated Professor Ogan's support as a student. I first met him in the late 1980s when I was still in school, and when he was kind enough to allow an overenthusiastic young one join the excavations at Nauth. How well I remember those weeks. He took me, along with some other Spanish and Austrian students, to see archaeological sites right across the northeast of Ireland, bouncing about on the back of that minibus that James mentioned earlier. He was less than impressed, though, when I tried to use one of the, de one of the decorated stones from Nouth as a door prop in the tea hut. I still remember the roar he let out. Roars aside, he was wonderfully kind. I stayed with the Ogan clan one weekend when there were no other diggers around, and I vividly remember a trip to his garden in Nobber to pick gooseberries. Every time I saw him in subsequent years, he had a kind word and a genuine interest. And I love the fact that even in his retirement, I was more likely to bump into him at an international conference abroad than somewhere in Dublin. So I'm particularly honoured to have been invited to talk here today, and I remember him with the greatest of fondness and respect. So, onto the Bronze Age and away from Ireland, and I apologise about that, but uh, onto, onto Britain. Bronze Age Europe is often viewed as the first globalised economy, a period in which technological innovation and long-distance trade together facilitated the creation of wealth, increasing, for, in, increasing interpersonal competition, and the emergence of institutionalised forms of social difference. According to this evolutionist perspective, the Bronze Age is a stepping stone towards the modern world. Central to the developments of the period, it is argued, were the activities of male warriors, traders, and chiefs. Women, in contrast, are viewed as objects of masculine control, displaying the wealth of their husbands in bronze and gold ornaments, and traded as wives to bolster the political aspirations of male kin. This common vision of the Bronze Age foregrounds certain aspects of the evidence, such as the appearance of wealthy burials, the development of specialized weapons like swords and rapiers, and the accumulation of hordes of scrap metal for recycling and exchange. It also interprets that evidence from a very particular perspective. Men buried with bronze or gold grave goods are chiefs, traders, or craftsmen. Women buried with bronze or gold grave goods are bartered brides. Although it is widely accepted that bronze was not always commodified, even socially significant items exchanged as gifts are viewed primarily as objects to be manipulated in strategies of social and political aggrandizement. Iconographic depictions of Bronze Age warriors, for example on Scandinavian rock art, appear to support this vision of the Bronze Age in which an ideology of competitive individualism underpinned social and economic life. Quite a different image of the Bronze Age is presented when, when one examines other aspects of the evidence, however. In Britain, my focus in this paper, the expansion of developer-funded archaeology over the past 30 years has reframed our perspective away from the hordes and burials that dominated narratives of the Bronze Age for much of the 20th century. The most common finds now recovered during developer-funded excavations are the residues of everyday life. Some 8,000 settlements of Middle Bronze Age data have now been recorded, for example. The roundhouses that characterise the architecture of the period in Britain, often part of dense networks of settlement, open settlements, field systems, waterholes and droveways scattered across the landscape, present an alternative reading of, the Bronze, Age, of Bronze Age life in which competition between warrior elites is far from everyday experience and in which women were not devoid of agency but were co-participants in complex social and cultural worlds. In fact, colonial and dualist thinking lies at the heart of accepted narratives, 
the competitive individualism and economic intensification that are imagined for the Bronze Age are predicated on modes of thinking that are characteristic of the modern Western world, in which self is divided from other, subject from object, culture from nature, and men from women. In this way, it is possible to see artefacts, women, animals, and land as objects to be manipulated and, exp and exploited for economic and political gain. But such dualisms are the product of the colonial histories of the recent past. Recent European colonialism was legitimated by figuring land, natural resources, and indigenous people as objectified others without history or agency, beyond the bounds of normal social and moral relations. Thus, they could be transformed into commodities to be bought, sold, and controlled. But how do these general comments on the Bronze Age relate to recent advances in archaeogenetics? The potential of ancient DNA to yield extraordinary insights into human mobility, interaction, and social structure has been hailed as a scientific revolution. At the beginning of the Bronze Age, the appearance of populations whose genetic ancestry ultimately derived from the Eurasian steppes has been interpreted as indicating the large-scale migration of young men, described by archaeologists as war bands, seeking new territories and intermarrying with local women. These men are viewed as agents of significant social and economic change, introducing new technologies such as metalworking, new modes of transport, and intensive exploitation of secondary products. Beyond the macro level of population genetics, the past few years have also seen increasing numbers of fine-grained analyses of prehistoric burials and cemeteries to understand kinship structures, marriage and residence rules in Bronze Age communities. To date, most of these studies have argued that the primary unit of kinship was the monogamous nuclear family and that patrilineal descent, patrilocal residence and female exogamy, where a woman moves to join her husband on marriage, were the norm. The results of archaeogenetic research therefore appear to support views of male-dominated hierarchical Bronze Age societies. In this talk, I want to examine evidence for kinship and marriage patterns at the beginning of the British Bronze Age. Before we turn to the archaeological evidence, it is useful to consider indigenous and anthropological critiques of contemporary Western models of kinship, marriage, and gender. Indigenous thinkers and other scholars have demonstrated that the imposition of settler sexuality on indigenous communities was a core component of European colonialism in recent centuries. Colonial ideologies defined patriarchal, heteronormative, and monogamous family structures as a moral imperative, central to the civilizing mission of European settlers. Children growing up in, in indigenous families that did not conform to this model were removed to be re-educated in institutions, and those whose sexual identity did not fit the dominant binary were shunned, ridiculed, and murdered. By controlling women and identifying certain types of intimate relations as immoral, the ownership and transmission of land and other forms of wealth could be regulated, class boundaries maintained, and certain forms of labor, notably reproductive labor, obscured and appropriated. Colonial ideologies imposed hegemonic masculinity on the indigenous other, defining women and men as unequal opposites in a world structured by binaries. As we attempt to reconstruct past forms of kinship and marriage, it is crucial that we remember that as a discipline, archaeology is profoundly interconnected with colonialism and its legacies. Indigenous theorists have called into question Euro-American ideas about kinship, describing how in other cultural contexts, kinship extends to non-human others, including plants and animals, sustained through relations of care, obligation, and inter interdependency. In many indigenous communities, it is not sexual relations that determine rights over resources. Rather, it is relations with non-human others, such as animals or the land itself, that are central to the constitution of kinship abiding emotional attachments to place or links to, 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 to totemic and ancestral animals define identity and ensure access to resources. Indigenous ways of understanding the world indicate that trees or mountains or animals are not like kin, but rather are kin. Western conceptions of kinship consider it possible for kinship, kin relations to exist only between humans. This is due to the distinctions that are drawn between culture and nature, self and other, and humans and animals, distinctions that serve particular ideological purposes in the present. By stripping non the non-human world of agency, 
Western forms of kinship foreground and legitimize extractive rather than meaningful social relations between humans and non-human others. In contrast, indigenous scholars propose expansive definitions of kinship that encompass relations beyond those centered on procreation, ownership, and control. These perspectives underscore the ties of mutual care and inter interdependency between humans and non-humans, which must be nurtured in order to ensure a sustainable world. They consider what it means to be in relation with others, and they propose an inclusive definition of kinship as the, outgoing, as the outcome of ongoing acts of mutual care. This perspective makes space for forms of kinship that are not predicated on sexual reproduction. It allows for alternative visions of gender and sexuality that can include other than humans as kin. Set in this context then, it is little surprise that in fact Eurocentric formulations of kin and family are far from universal. Anthropologists have long discussed the extraordinary cross-cultural variability in the character and organization of kinship. There is, always, there is always an element of cultural selection built into kinship systems. Some relationships are considered more significant than others. For example, Cecilia Busby's study of kinship in southern India has shown that the children of a woman and those of her brother are considered to be unrelated as women pass on female substance to their children in the form of blood and breast milk, while men pass on male substance in the form of semen. The children of a brother and sister therefore do not share the same substance. Genetic relatedness, in other words, does not directly translate to social relatedness. This is because in many societies, although the physical process of procreation is acknowledged, it may not be considered socially significant. Evans Pritchard's classic study of the newer in the early 20th century illustrated how cattle are said to beget children. Newer fatherhood was not predicated on sexual relations with the mother, but on the transfer of cattle in bride wealth transactions. If a woman's husband died, she could take a new partner, but any children from the sec second relationship were considered to be the children of the man on, whom, on whose behalf her bride wealth was originally paid. In many other societies too, biological parentage is not the primary determinant of kinship. Instead, kinship is viewed as socially and culturally constituted, as the outcome of social, not sexual, relations. Kinship is understood to be a product of social practices, including ritual exchange and the sharing of food. Janet Carston, for example, describes how, on the island of Langkawi in Malaysia, Kinship is viewed as an ongoing process that involves the sharing of substance. By living and eating together in the same house and by having children together, the blood of the husband and wife become increasingly similar over time. Foster children and other people related by marriage who eat food together also come to share the same blood. Because kin are made, not determined by birth, kinship can be strategic and situational. In many parts of Highland New Guinea, Immigrants are quickly absorbed into local descent groups as residents and not genetic links is the most important factor in determining kinship. Although most societies in this region are patrilineal in principle, that is, they trace their descent through the father's line, in practice, co-resident maternal kin and uh, people related by marriage may be considered members of the descent group, while kin related through the paternal line who live at a distance may be forgotten. So too, in many societies, <coughs> excuse me, different forms of kinship may be important in different contexts. In parts of eastern Nigeria, for example, land is passed down through the paternal line, but cattle, money, and cult membership are inherited from maternal kin. A final key point to draw from the anthropological literature on kinship before we turn to the archaeology is that although broad types of kinship organization can be identified, for example, patrilineality, that is descent through the father's line, their socio-political implications and the way they operate in practice differ significantly from society to society. Gender ideologies and the position of women in patrilineal societies are extremely variable, for example. These observations have several significant implications for our interpretation of the genetic evidence. Firstly, dominant Euro-American binary and heteronormative models of kinship and gender have their origins in a particular historical context and cannot be assumed to be universal. Secondly, 
genetic relationships are not the sole determinant of, determinant of kinship. Rather, social practices of various sorts make kin, and kinship transcends biological links. The material world is often central to the creation of kin, and non-human others can be considered to be kin. This suggests that there may be other ways of understanding how kin relations were constructed in the past that may be archaeologically accessible beyond the identification of biological links. Although aspects of the archaeology of Bronze Age Britain appear to fit the traditional narrative for the period of male-dominated societies, in fact, alternative readings of the mortuary data are also possible. Here, I want to consider how to interpret the evidence for biological kin kinship presented in Inigo Elalde and colleagues' recent study of archaeogenetic change in early Bronze Age Britain. Although the primary focus of that study was on genetic change at a population level rather than kinship, nonetheless, in genetic links were incidentally identified between 16 individuals in their data set. Twelve of these individuals were indeed related through the paternal line, suggesting that patrilineal descent was an important factor in the reckoning of social identity. The most remarkable set of genetic relatives were four individuals distributed across three cemeteries located within 10 kilometers of Stonehenge. And I should say here, the circles are females and the triangles are males. Two adult men buried in neighboring graves on Amesbury Down in Wiltshire were most likely paternal cousins. The daughter of one of these men was buried on Porton Down, while their paternal uncle was buried on Wilsford Down, both just a few kilometers away. Another pair of paternal relatives from Amesbury Down was identified from the so-called Boscombe Bowman grave. Here, the inhumation burial of an adult male was probably the paternal cousin or half-brother of an individual whose disarticulated skull had been placed at his feet. In this case, genetic relatedness is reflected in bodily and presumably social intimacy. Anthropological studies of kinship demonstrate that even where there is patrilineal descent in principle, relationships with maternal kin continue to be highly important, facilitating access to land, goods, titles, and so on. It is therefore no surprise that maternal relations were sometimes also foregrounded. For example, the articulated burial of a 9 to 11 year old female from Amesbury Down was placed in a pit adjacent to another pit containing an adult female skull and vertebrae. Ancient DNA and radiocarbon evidence suggests that the child was probably the genetic maternal aunt of the neighboring burial. Although these individuals may never have met during life, their relationship was considered significant in death. Elsewhere, a young man and woman buried together in the same grave at Trumping Trumpington Meadows in Cambridgeshire were second to third degree relatives belonging to the same matrilineage. It is possible that matrilineal descent was the key principle of kinship organization in this community, hinting at regional variability in kinship structures. Radiocarbon dates on the remains of these two individuals are statistically in indistinguishable. They may have been half siblings related through their mother. In matrilineal societies, a woman's loyalty is to her brother, not her husband. Alternatively, they may have been the children of two sisters. Parallel cousins, that is, the children of same-sex siblings, are regarded as siblings in many societies, and marriage between them is prohibited. As previously noted, many scholars have suggested that women were exchanged as marriage partners by their male relatives in the Bronze Age. The argument that Bronze Age societies were patrilineal and practiced virilocal marriage, where a woman moves to join her husband on marriage, is perhaps supported by the female burial from Porton Down. We saw a little bit earlier on. She was the genetic daughter of a man buried on Amesbury Down, some six and a half kilometers to the northwest, so appears to have lived at a distance from her paternal kin. However, the reconstruction of residence patterns in this period is complicated by evidence for a significant residential mobility. We cannot assume that relatives who were buried together actually lived together during life. Isotope analysis indicates that both men and women moved during this period, and it is clearly problematic to assume that the movement of women was so solely for the purpose of marriage, when residential mobility might in fact have been a common life experience regardless of gender. Certainly, 
Calcolithic and early Bronze Age cemeteries cannot be assumed to represent all members of a particular residential or kin group, and other priorities may have determined place of burial. The woman from Porton Down, for example, was one of a group of burials of four females and six children in a segmented ring ditch. She lay approximately a metre to the northwest of a large grave at the centre of the monument that contained the disarticulated remains of another adult female. The central grave had been revisited to access and manipulate that woman's bones. Her skull was missing, suggesting that it may have been retrieved for deliberate curation or redeposition elsewhere. This female individual may have therefore have been considered a significant ancestor and likely op occupied a position of authority during life. The women buried in this monument were certainly not accorded social positions relative to men, but, ra but rather on their own terms. Cemeteries in, of this state in Britain are frequently interpreted as the burial grounds of particular descent groups because in many cases there is a linear element to the arrangement of graves that is thought to reflect genealogical succession. However, ideas of kinship and descent may not have been wholly based on biological relatedness. At several sites, close spatial relationships between burials that likely reflected intimate interpersonal ties in life are not mirrored in the genetic data. For example, at Ingleby Fields, oh, sorry, at Windmill Fields, Ingleby Barwick in North Yorkshire, four individuals were buried within a few metres of one another. Their radiocarbon dates suggest that they were broadly contemporary, but none of them were genetic relatives. Here, co-residents may have determined kinship, as is common in many contemporary societies. I have already pointed out that the heteronormative character of kinship in the contemporary Western world serves particular purposes, supporting a view of gender identity that is integral to colonial and capitalist modes of political and economic power. This means that it is important to be open to exploring the archaeological evidence for other types of relationship. At Needingworth Quarry in Cambridgeshire, an adult female, aged 18 to 25 years, was laid at the base of a deep grave. The grave was subsequently recut, and a second adult female, more than 40 years old, was interred. Their deaths were not many years apart, but they were not genetically closely related. Anthropological studies of kinship and gender suggest that there are various different ways in which this grave might be interpreted. It is possible that they were co-wives in a polygamous marriage. Alternatively, these burials might represent an instance of woman-to-woman -woman marriage. Historically, woman-to-woman -woman marriage was widespread in Africa. A woman presumed to be barren could divorce her husband and remain in her father's home. She could then herself marry a woman whose children would count her as their father and who would be members of her patrilineage. Woman-to-woman -woman marriage enhanced women's status and offered greater social and sexual freedom. It is also possible that the women from the Needingworth Quarry grave were in an intimate same-sex relationship. This is something that is rarely considered in our discussions of kinship and marriage in the Bronze Age, or indeed in general. Archaeogenetics clearly provides extraordinary new opportunities to understand kinship in the past. However, because of the valorization of science in contemporary academia, there is some danger of prioritizing scientific data over other archaeological evidence for the making of kinship in the past. As archaeologists, we need to have more confidence in our ability to speak about different ways of relating. Making kin involves material technologies. In the contemporary world, direct-to-consumer genetic testing kits do not so much reveal kin as make them, just as the material economies of love create and sustain ideologies of kinship in the present. Michaela Di Leonardo, for example, shows how the task of making and maintaining kin relations is primarily assigned to women in contemporary North America, and how the material world is central to that process, for example, by sending greeting cards and organizing ho holiday gatherings. Archaeologists, of course, are particularly well placed to investigate technologies of kinship in the past, for these are directly reflected in material practice. In a Bronze Age context, as we've already described above, kinship is created in the spatial articulation and manipulation of the bodies of the dead. However, kinship was not solely located in the human body. The archaeological record also provides rich evidence for different technologies of kinship. 
For example, at Towthorpe in East Yorkshire, a barrow covering the inhumation burial of an adult male was built of materials from three distinct sources. Soil from the immediate vicinity of the barrow, clay from Burdale, a mile to the west, and clay from another location that I've chopped out of my, uh, helpfully chopped out of my, my paper here, never mind, I forgot, Dugdale, that's it, I remember now. Clay from Dugdale, a mile and a half to the north. The mound was composed of layers of these clays, alternating with layers of soil from the immediate vicinity of the barrow, and each kind of clay predominated at the side of the mound nearest the place from which it had been brought. Here, kin were made not through the bodies of the dead themselves, but through other forms of social practice. In this case, when people brought baskets of different materials from significant places in the landscape. In doing so, they marked the contribution of different kin groups to the substance of the deceased. Archaeologists are well placed also to consider the implications of indigenous scholars' call to move beyond models of kinship rooted in the heteronormative, patriarchal, and anthropocentric structures of settler sexuality. These scholars consider what it means to be in relation with others, and they develop a more expansive and inclusive definition of kinship as the, on, as the outcome of ongoing acts of mutual care. This perspective makes space for forms of kinship that are not predicated on sexual reproduction and that are open to including other than humans as kin. In Bronze Age Britain, Bob Johnson has explored how kin relations were rooted in places invested with animal, animate and ancestral powers. These relations can be traced in material interventions in the landscape, such as the deposition of bronzes and other objects at striking landmarks. For example, on Dartmoor in Devon, a complete pot was found placed in a crevice, partway up the face of an imposing granite outcrop. This can be interpreted as an offering to ancestral spirits whose powers were vested in this place, a gesture of ongoing care towards ancestral lands and a manifestation of kin relations with both human and non-human persons. Relations with animals may also speak of kinship links. Sometimes these were the intimate interconnections of everyday life. At Cliffsend Farm in Kent, for example, a sub-adult female lay flexed on her right hand si on her right hand side, her head resting on a cattle skull. It is possible that this, this animal had been gifted as part of the bride wealth of this young woman or her female kin. Other relations may be more totemic in character. For example, the cremation burial of a child at Skilmafilly in Aberdeenshire included a pair of burnt go golden eagle talons. Totemic animals are usually understood as kin, the original progenitors of their human descendants, their frequent slippage between human and non-human form in myth, reminding us that the boundary between human and animal is not always viewed as categorically elsewhere as it is in our own cultural context. In this paper, I hope to have demonstrated that bringing together theories of social practice with critical perspectives on the social salience or the social significance of the biological links revealed by ancient DNA has much to tell us about kinship. Ancient DNA analysis has come to be viewed as the most accurate means of revealing prehistoric kinship structures, yet it is crucial that we avoid reading the genetic evidence in ways that unthinkingly impose contemporary conceptions of kinship and gender relations onto the past. A century of anthropological analysis of kinship and marriage demonstrates the extraordinary diversity of ways in which humans organize and understand their relationships with one another. We meet, need to remain open to that diversity and consider alternative ways of interpreting the archaeogenetic evidence that go beyond our own lived experience. Moreover, kinship cannot be viewed as a direct reflection of genetic links. Kinship is not a given or natural fact, but is a process the outcome of culturally prescribed social practices that require careful nurture, work, and commitment. Archaeological evidence provides many insights into how relations were created and maintained through varied technologies of kinship, both focused on the body and beyond it. This is a different but complementary perspective to that offered by archaeogenetics, which identifies genetic links, but does not immediate, re immediately reveal their social significance. Most crucially, though, we must move beyond biogenetic determinism to consider the ways in which social practice generated enduring effective bonds and the sharing of substance with both human and non-human others. These points have implications for our understanding of the Bronze Age more generally. They require us to 
question anthropocentric and androcentric notions of agency and to consider alternative concepts of gender, personhood and kinship. Set within this context, it becomes easier to understand evidence that appears to challenge accepted models of Bronze Age society, such as the discovery of wealthy female burials, the decentralized production of high status weaponry like swords, or the evident regional and contextual variability in how social identity was constructed. So, thank you very much.